This is Wednesday, May 8th. There are 70 days until San Diego Comic-Con 2019. Welcome to SD Concast, the official podcast of the San Diego Comic-Con unofficial blog. V-A-N-U-H-T-E-E, go. Oh my god, I love Life Journal, and my Life Journal loves me. Current mood is hyperactive, current music, Refuge 73. I love the color scheme, it's pink and purple. All right. Good evening, everybody. I am your host, James Riley, and joining me on the podcast tonight, as always, Carrie Dixon. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in. And our special guest this evening is Mark Evanier. Welcome, hey, Mark. Mark. How are you well, doing this evening? I'm fine. Thank you. I'm, I'm actually here. I made it. I got. I, I, I was on the wrong browser for a few minutes here. but I'm, I find, That's found okay. Me. We are oh. glad that you did. Thank you. Yes. So we're, we're going very to excited. Off. Yes, we are actually uh, talking over each other here. Uh, we're going to be taking uh, comments and questions during the show. So if you have a question for Mark, just uh, let us know by tweeting us at SD underscore comic underscore con or use the hashtag SD concast or uh, send us a message in the YouTube live chat. We'll be keeping an eye on that. And uh, I guess let's just get started. Carrie, why don't you get us started? Sure. Uh, so... Mark, as I think you very obviously know, this is a huge year for Comic-Con. It's the 50th anniversary, but it's also your 50th year of attending. Yes. Right? right? Yes. <laughs> what, what, what does that mean to you? Like, what does 50 I, years I, of Comic-Con mean to you? I don't understand how I can do that when I'm 23 years old. Uh, but the, uh, no, it's, it's kind of amazing to me uh, there was only one person I ever encountered who thought Comic-Con would blossom into what it became. And that was my one-time employer, Jack Kirby. Um, and he envisioned exactly what this convention was going to become. And nobody believed him at the time. I've discovered that throughout Jack's entire career, he would say things like to the people at Marvel, oh, someday there will be, you know, huge box office blockbusters of the Avengers and the X-Men and Iron Man, and they didn't believe him then. So uh, I, I have now learned that I've got to believe everything Jack ever told me. Uh, and yeah, it's amazing. We had 300 people at the first um, Comic-Con, which wasn't called Comic-Con International back then. And now you get in an elevator and there's 300 people and they're dressed as Harley Quinn. Uh, some of them even women. Uh, it's amazing what it's become, and it's a great, fun experience. It's a joy of my life every year. Um, I couldn't live at that pace and in those crowds all year, but it's fun to do it for four or five days every so often. And um, I'm looking forward to this. Did you say 70 day? I better go unpack from last year, I think. <laughs> right? Yes. <laughs> The, the, the downtime after con is uh, is very extended uh, these days because of how much energy it takes to to do the con. Yeah, it, yes. it's, it's kind of amazing to me. For the last 20 years or so, I get there and I walk into the convention hall and it, for a moment there, I think all of these people have been here for the last year. Uh, when I left, they just locked the place up and the dealers just sat in here for the, for the whole year mar marking up the prices on their goods. And we come back and there's the same dealers in the same place and the same exhibits and i run into some of the same people and it's like brigadoon has reappeared one once again for for you know four days plus a pre i love that brigadoon <laughs> did not have a preview night but other than that it's a great it's very similar <laughs> you're not wrong actually <laughs> that's funny oh so, so, so yeah, I, i'm just amazed at at how long it's been around and uh um uh, and that it's become such a, a force for wonderfulness and memories and friendships and careers and people filling in their runs of you know Batman comics and whatever whatever happens there it just happens and I think everybody who goes there with the right attitude has a wonderful time and it's it's kind of nice to be around. In, in a, I'll tell you about two or three years ago, a friend of mine. Uh, my friend Carolyn Kelly, my, my girlfriend for many years who's since left us, uh, she brought some friends of hers down out from the, the East Coast 
who had no interest that I knew of in comic books or animation or science fiction or superheroes or any of that sort. She just wanted them to see the convention. And they came out, they were a lovely couple. They were, one of them was uh, her old uh, buddy, best friend from you know, elementary school. That's how long they know each other. And at the end of the convention, the, the two friends said to me, we had the greatest time of our lives there. And I said, could you explain why? Because you're not interested in comic books or animation or any of this stuff. And they said for four and a half days, we were around people who had made something. Everywhere you look, someone had made a book, had set a painting, had made a costume, had made a, a sculpture of Scott Shaw out of Lego blocks, whatever it was, they were, it was just a, a, an exciting place to be and to see all these people who were talented and industrious and imaginative and um, that was exhilarating for them. And I, and I realized that's one of the things I like about the convention. I just like being around so many people who are having such a good time sharing something they love and sharing their talents and sharing their knowledge. And uh, uh, you don't get that in the real world these days. It, it's very nice. It takes us away from politics and the news and, and all those things. We just get, we get four and a half days of just lots of people having fun. Which is very rare. Yeah. And, and speaking of what we hope to have fun with this year, considering it's the 50th anniversary, what are you uh, personally hoping to see happen? Uh, what are things you expect and hope to see? Well, I gave, they, the convention came to me a couple of times and asked me what I would suggest they do for the 50th anniversary. And I thought it'd be nice to take all the money the convention takes in this year, the whole gross receipts, and divide it among the people who've been to every single convention <laughs> with, with particular emphasis on who's done the most panels. Oh, really? And, and <laughs> they somehow didn't go for this. I, I didn't, Crazy. don't understand why. Uh, as far as I know, there's only five of us who've been to every one of them. And I'm looking forward to uh, some panels and discussions about how Comic-Con came to be um, sharing that shared experience most of us who were there at the early days had of watching it develop watching it occasionally go awry watching it each year top the year before and uh, i am fascinated by the inner workings of comic-con i have worked so long with the people i, I people should understand i am not an employee of comic-con i am not a, on the committee i'm not on the board i have some people, because I do so many panels and so many events there, people think somehow I'm part of the of the management. I'm not. I'm just an enthusiast, and I, I'm certainly not the complaint department for the convention, as many people <laughs> in my email believe I am. It's but, okay. Neither uh, are we. <laughs> I, yes, you have the same problem too. Uh, but I am amazed at how well it's it's operated. It, it operates. One of the reasons I think that San Diego is the convention is not going to move out of San Diego is that these people have mastered the ability to do that convention in that building, in that city, working with those hotels and those surrounding merchants and those uh, shuttle buses and everything that's involved. It's really amazing how much work goes into it and how many things could go wrong and don't. And I know there will be a lot of people watching this who will complain, oh, yeah, well, they forgot to open the dealer's room at the right time or, or this panel didn't start on time. Everybody's got their own complaints about their own personal experiences. But the convention is so brilliantly and cleverly run yeah. that you don't see how much, how much sweat there is because they do it so well. And uh, I, I would like to hear a little more about that. I like learning about how the convention works. I like learning about the backstage stuff that they go through. Um, one of the things that has inter interested me for, for 50, well, 49 years now, whoever was running the convention at that point would come to me and say, if you have any suggestions, we'd love to hear them. Tell us what we're doing wrong. Give us a suggestion. So I will make a suggestion, and that sounds very logical to me, very uh, like a great idea. And the response frequently, not always, sometimes they do it. But sometimes the, the response is, you know, that would be a great idea, except that, and they tell me a reason it can't be done that would never have occurred to me because I don't know that much about how it works. 
and somehow yeah. there's like, well, there's a union thing, or there's a legal thing, and there's a, a, a the city has a tariff on this, and the th things that I don't know about. We don't know, we who attend it, even if we attend it every damn time, we don't know how they manage to pull this thing off every year. And, uh, and I'm and I'm amazed at that. Uh, I'm amazed at how sharp a lot of the convention employees are, how good they are, how benevolent they are. Uh, I go to other comic conventions occasionally. I'm just now, I, just before I got off on your here, I'm I'm uh, working out the travel arrangements with the Heroes Con in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. My friend Sergio Aragones and I are going back for that in June, and they're very good. It's a very seems to be a very good convention too. But it's a different kind of convention. Yes. And Comic Con is partly because of size, partly because of scope, partly because of the way uh, it's run for. I don't know. I don't know how much Heroes Con is run for profit, but for profit conventions are a very different animal. And uh, I'd like to compare and contrast that. I would never want to run a convention. I'd never want to be a part of it. But I, I like watching how how they operate. Yeah, behind the scenes is always fascinating. That's why you know all the special features on on DVDs and such are are always so popular. Is because you like to see you know you like to see how the sauce is made. Yeah, that's exactly it. And and uh, um, I've been in kind of a unique situation to work with the convention over the years and a unique position to observe what they do. And every so often, they have come to me for crisis counseling about some popular comic book artist and writer who maybe is out of line and they they would like me like me to speak to women <laughs> and, and you know as a, as a as a you know alleged peer and tell them to knock it off or they come to me and they say we have a problem with this guy doesn't want to be sitting next to this guy or you know there's little fights and feuds yeah. things like that and uh you know i like to do what i can to help out uh but they don't really need much help that's ama it's amazing to me I'm going to stop gushing about the convention management because I've already got my invitation. So I don't, I don't need to say any more of that. No, no, no. I mean, I actually think that, that that would be a great thing for them to do for their 50th anniversary is Comic-Con truthfully, like so rarely toots their own horn and they like to kind of stay the wizard behind the curtain. And it, like you said, I mean, it'd be cool if they would pull back and give some stories about here's the history of us, like actually putting on the convention. So I think that's a great idea. Yeah, there, there, there's it's 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 a fascinating animal. Somebody is going to write an incredible book about it someday. Uh, it might be yes. me. Might even be me. I don't know. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, Mark, in those fifty years that you have been attending, what would you say are some moments or memories that really stand out to you? Oh boy, there's there's <laughs> there's, there's one every year, at least one every year. Uh, last year. Since I saw you last was on your show, we had this wonderful thing. We, you know, I, 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 I administer a thing called the Bill Finger Award every year, which is mm -hmm. for uh, a comic book writer who has done a great body of work but has not received adequate uh, rewards and or recognition. And uh, and then and the and the odd thing is, every year on my blog, I ask people to nominate. And some people don't get the concept. They nominate their favorite artist. <laughs> or they nominate the most well-compensated famous person in comics <laughs> because they like his work or was like that. It's it's yeah. not they don't they don't grasp the concept anyway. But last year our we, we each year we have a, a posthumous award and an alive award. And the alive award last year was this woman, uh, Joy Murchison Kelly. I think I talked about her on your 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 uh, podcast last year. Um, and she was the perfect guest because when I told people we're giving the award to Joy Burgess and Kelly, they said, who's that? Proving she was not recognized enough. And Joy Burgess and Kelly is this woman. She was in her early 90s. Um, and until I called her one day and, and, and offered her a free trip to, to, uh, to San Diego with, for her and her husband, she really had never heard of this thing. She didn't know about it. And can you imagine having the best weekend of your life when you're 94 <laughs> years old, doing something you never knew existed? <laughs> you know, that, that she wasn't, it wasn't like she was sitting around thinking, oh, if only someone would recognize my work and fly me to San Diego. Yeah. 
convention. No, she. this came out of nowhere for her. She came out, she was worshipped and honored and interviewed and applauded. And and uh, she and her husband, who were just an adorable couple, we just, we, 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 we liked the husband as much as we liked the, the wife, um, got there and, 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 you know, here we are in front of an audience and there's 4,000 people standing, giving her a standing ovation. This is a woman who wrote Wonder Woman in 19, early 1940s for a few years for, you know, the kind of money you'd now get for working at Subway sandwiches places. And she put it behind her. She went on herself. She went on to other things. Uh, she had never been applauded in her life. She never really connected with the people who loved her work. She never had someone come to her with, you know, copies of old Wonder Woman comics and say, please, would you sign this? I really, you are a role model for me. I love your work. You, I, I, wish, I just want to thank you for all the wonderful things you did. You know, I just, I, I, I'm not sentimental about a lot of things, but, but I just thought that was such a wonderful experience and to sit there and watch how happy she was. And she kept hugging me and, and her husband kept <laughs> hugging me. And, and um, you know, that was such a wonderful experience. Uh, and for the people who met, not just for me, it was all these people kept coming up to me saying, thank you for getting her out here. It's so great that we got to meet her. It's so wonderful that, that, she got some applause in her lifetime because the current generation of people who write and draw comics, the ones who got into it in the last 10 or 20 years, knew that there was stardom attached to it of some sort. They knew that they would get to conventions. Most of them had gone to conventions as fans and dreamed of the day when they were there as celebrities. Uh, they knew that it was possible to make really good money in comics if you were famous enough. Uh, they knew they'd sign autographs. They knew they'd get applauded. But uh, when I got into comics, the primary, uh, I, I got into comic books basically in 1970. I mean, you know, you hear people talk about the golden age and the silver age, and they debate when they ended. For future information, the silver age of comics ended the day I got in. <laughs> they went, oh, Evan Ears writing comics now. Time to stop the good stuff, where it's over. You know, this is the end of this. It's like, it's like, you know, it's like all the painters going, end of the Renaissance, stop doing great work, folks. So uh, I got to know and be with and be around and work with people who got into comics in, their, in the 1940s and the 1950s, people whose work I grew up on, who got into the field just because it was a good job that they, they, liked, they liked the idea of being paid to sit there and write and draw all day. They didn't imagine they'd ever be in front of an audience. They didn't imagine they'd ever have um, people, uh, uh, fans, they'd have people applauding them. Um, about 20 years or so ago, maybe 20, a little more than that, uh, the convention brought out a man named Nick Carty, who was a comic book artist who had been in comics since the early days. He drew the Teen Titans, he drew Aquaman, he drew a comic called Batlash that many people love. One of the better artists who worked in comics over the years. And he worked in isolation, he didn't have a lot of fans. And he, he came out to the San Diego Con and he was sitting at a table, signing autographs and doing occasional sketches. And one after another, people in the, of another generation came up to him and said, Mr. Cardi, I became an artist because of you. Mr. Cardi, I grew up on your work. I love, Nick was the, was the kind of guy who would cry if you told him the tide was going out. And he kept weeping for happiness. He was, I've never seen a man so happy in my life while crying. Uh, and I just love that stuff. I'm a sucker for that, that, for that kind of sentiment, that kind of honest emotion. I like the idea that these guys who got into a business where you could never get rich, they thought, where you could never get any recognition, they thought, were suddenly getting recognition, were getting paid for their autograph, where people were offering Nick Cardi money to do drawings of Wonder Girl for, for you know, please, I, I, I want, can you do an oil painting of, I'll give you all this money if you will give me a, do a, a painting for me. Um, I felt, you know, that was like, we're giving back to the, that generation on whose shoulders we stand. So um, I know I'm rambling here, but Joy Murchison Kelly is an example of that. Nick Cardi was an example of that. We've had tons of people at these conventions who've been honored and, and, and got some respect for their work. 
I think I told the story last year on this podcast about we brought out John Broom one year who had never been to a convention. We did the only convention of his life he came to and was applauded by um, essentially the next generation of comic book writers. They all turned out for him. Uh, the joy that, that they brought to so many of these guys who worked for this bad money without credit sometimes and created these great, wonderful comics, some of which are now legendary, some of which, you know, heritage auctions and selling for, you know, six figures, seven figures. Uh, I think there's a Frank Frazetta painting up right now. Frank Frazetta painting going on heritage. It's up to like $6 million because of the fans loving this man's work and, and, and uh, giving him a certain immortality uh, now that he, after he passed away. And I, I'm actually <laughs> going to ask you about uh, the Joy Murchison Kelly panel because I actually attended that and I thought it was an amazing panel. She she didn't pull any punches and it was it was just so great to hear her talk about working back then. Well, there's a nice thing about someone who's like in their 90s. They have nothing to lose. <laughs> I mean, she, she was very honest and very candid. What, you know, what's somebody going to do, fire her? <laughs> um, uh, and she was just overwhelmed by the by by young career women there were a lot of them a lot of women cartoonists who sought her out or or went to her women writers and things like that who talked about being a role her being a role model for them uh and how uh, who really appreciated what it took to be a female writer in 1943. Uh, it's not as common today as it should be but it was unheard of back then. And you know, she's a woman who started out wanting to be an actress, and she never quite got into that properly. But she wrote some wonderful stories for a while. Yeah. So in in talking about, you know, the all of the uh, people from the 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, we actually lost one of the key figures last year after Comic Con. Stan Lee passed away. We lost a number of them. We lost Steve we Dick after the convention. We lost yes. the, the 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 in memoriam. Uh, we talk about both of those. Stan and and Steve are two of the icons of the industry. Even though one of them went, you know, into you know basically having his presence everywhere, and the other went and just holed up in his apartment in New York and drew for the next sixty years. Yeah, well, that was I, I. I knew Steve Ditko a little bit. That's what he wanted. I mean, he got into comics because he liked working alone and in relative isolation. It was a good job for him, and he had ideas to express. Very talented, wonderful man whose whose work will be reprinted long after we're all gone. Um, he was he was one of the giants. There were a lot of those guys, some of whom didn't get that much appreciation in their lifetime. Um, I wish Ditko had come out to a convention. He, Steve Ditko went to the very first comic convention in New York and then never went back to another one after that. Uh, and uh, uh, I kind of wish he had, well, I don't know how comfortable he would have been, but there are a lot of guys who I wish had lived long enough to be guests of honor at San Diego and to reap some of those little rewards uh, they got. You know, a lot of these guys had no pension they had no social security payments, really. They had, uh, and when they got too old to draw or write, whatever it was, or they, the business no longer wanted them, their income was doing commissions for fans or doing projects. Um, there's a number of artists, older people, who, who uh, basically th their pension was fans buying artwork from them, pan fans commissioning jobs from them. Uh, uh, it was it, it's, it's a, the the industry supported a lot of them in their old old age. What uh, what do you think? Well, uh, talking about Stan, what do you think he he brought to the table beyond you know the the co creating so much of the Marvel universe? Well, uh, yeah, Stan was a, an I I knew I met Stan in um, July of nineteen seventy. I I I think I am the only person alive who worked for both Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. Uh, and Stan uh, was a charming man to you. He, he had this way, if you approached him, of making him feel, making you feel like he was your fan. 
If you went up to him and said, oh, Mr. Lee, I really love your work, he'd ask you what you did, and he'd be so enthused about what you did. Um, and he was just very charming and gallant and, and uh, such. He uh, was a very good salesman for comics. He was a very good, he said it was a good salesman from himself at the same time, but he was a, a very good salesman for comics and he spoke well for them. The industry has never had a voice like his to talk about comics and the power of comics. Uh, some of the greatest talents we've had in comics are guys who, if you put them in front of a camera, they stiffened up and stammered and, and you know, looked like, you know, uh, Ralph Cramden selling the kitchen magician on the honeymooners. And there's an obscure reference. But uh, Stan was good in front of a camera, uh, charming, uh, a spokesman, um, you know, and, and uh, the first guy to become a real super, the only guy to become a really honest to God superstar to the point where if you go to the, uh, there's a website that tracks the uh, people who've been involved with the highest grossing movies. And you think it's going to be like the number one is going to be Harrison Ford or Samuel L. Jackson. The number one name on it is Stan Lee. You know? <laughs> and I think that's I think that's I think it's wonderful that comics had a guy who could um, be so ubiquitous and you know such. I have my own personal issues with Stan, which I don't think you want to talk about here. Uh, but you know, he. Uh, um, they did a, uh, a documentary on him. It was called uh, With Great Power or something like that. And I was in it. They, I was interviewed for it. And I went to the premiere, which was out at a Cineplex out in Pasadena. I was invited to that. Um, and Stan was working the red carpet. I refused to walk the red carpet. They, they got mad at me. I wouldn't walk the red carpet. I said, can I just go in and see the movie? They go, no, no, you're here to walk the red carpet. And I, so I, I, I snuck around the red carpet. And the guard, the security guard was saying, no, no, you got to walk the red carpet. Go back. And I didn't, I never walked around. But Stan was in the red carpet, greeting celebrities, having his picture taken, talking to the press. And I've never in my life seen a happier human being. Than that, he was so delightful, and to think again, you know, he was ninety-one at the time or something like that. To have the best day of your life when you're in your nineties—that's quite an accomplishment. Um, and uh, you know, I saw him at conventions signing things, and he was so happy about that stuff. And I, I, uh, you know, I, I have some issues, like I said, about credit and some things like that, but. Everybody should have gotten that, you know. It's and and, and we don't begrudge the yeah. fact that he got that. Uh, except I, I just I the line I tell people is the only thing I begrudge Stan is soul credit. But um, I think he was a very positive, wonderful force for comics. Um, and uh, you know, we, we will be talking about. I, I actually, you know, my tendency is I want to talk about the guys who didn't get the the, the accolades and didn't get the money. I want to talk about Russ Heath, and I, I mean. And I don't mean here necessarily, but when it comes time to talk about the great talents we lost in the last year, I would like to talk about some of the, the people who didn't get that kind of recognition. That's why I, I like you know running the Bill Finger Award, because we get to celebrate the people who didn't get that much attention. You know, it's like you know, in the Academy Awards and the and the the, the um, uh, TV Academy, they do the in memoriam thing and they put up all of the famous people who've died in the last year. And I'm thinking, hey, what about some of the writers? What about some of the costume designers who helped make those movies and those TV shows? Uh, yeah, we all know Burt Reynolds passed away. What about these 10 guys who didn't get their names uh, that much, who did just as good work in their own way? So. Well, on that same note, someone else, unfortunately, who we lost in the last year, who everyone who attends the convention should know, but I'm sure a lot of people don't, is the former president, John Rogers. Yeah. Did you know John? Yeah, I knew John. Really good man. Um, very smart. Very, uh, uh, you know, to, to be the president of something like that, to be the top guy there, is to have somebody coming up complaining and yelling at you every eight seconds and yep. uh i could never do a job like that you you two could probably never deal with a job like that it's an impossible job because everybody wants something everybody wants a bigger table everybody wants a better time slot everybody wants their room paid for john did 
did this. It, there are, sometimes there are dogs barking at you. Uh, John did this job so well and kept it mature and intelligent um, and, and, and set the role model for all the other people under him. Um, when he died, somebody said to me, oh, what's going to happen to the convention now? And uh, the answer is, uh, in, a good com in a big company, the greatest compliment you can give the top guy is that the company is not affected by his loss. That he's got things so well organized and so well trained that uh, it goes on without him. He's prepared for that. He's 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 made a machine that works so good that it it runs without him. And the convention will go on fine without him, which is not to say they don't miss him, and it's right. not to say that he didn't do his job wonderfully. Um, uh, you know, that's what I think about John Rogers. Yeah, I, I don't think you, you can look take a look at Comic Con as it exists today and not think that John Rogers didn't do a, a good job because it wouldn't. I don't think it would be where it would would be without his leadership. Yeah, and he's been he's been running it for I think it was over twenty years. I know he's been working for the convention for about thirty years, but he's been yeah. running it for a while. Yeah, you know, I mean, my relationship with John was like uh, every. Once a day at every convention, I would pass him in the hallway, and he'd shake my hand and say, "Oh, Mark, I heard that panel you did was great. Excuse me, I've got to go put out a fire." <laughs> and, be, and that was our relationship. He had so much to do at those conventions, and and yeah. and he was putting out fires constantly. Um, and um, you know, and there was other people who do them too. You know, there's a, sometimes a tendency to, you know, give the top guy a little too much credit. Um, in any in any organization, things like that. But you know, John deserves maximum credit for what he did, and uh, the fact that the convention will, uh, uh, you know, endure fine without him is a tribute to his organization skills and the fact that he he didn't make it a one man show. He's got a lot of good people there. Yeah. Well, let's take a couple of reader questions. I'm going to start with Stephanie L, who asked, Mark, what do you think is the biggest thing that has changed since the beginning of Comic-Con? Um, my hotel room. No. Um, <laughs> Price uh, of your hotel room. <laughs> uh, well, I think what's happened is at the beginning of Comic-Con, we, like I said, we had 300 people there. Now it's immense. And what's interesting, the thing that I actually, the thing that actually interests me the most is how important a comic book convention has become to that city. Uh, another reason I don't think the convention will ever move out of San Diego is because San Diego is, that whole area of San Diego is built around the comic convention. The economy will collapse without it there. Uh, they, you know, there's, you know, right next to the, the convention center was built in large part because of the comic convention. And the Marriott next door, and the Hyatt next to that, and the two Hiltons across the street, and the Omni, and all those restaurants are built were built for convention traffic, and the con comic convention was the business model for that. Um, I remember there was one year when they announced the dates for the Comic Con, and then they had to move them because the Republican National Committee wanted that hall in order to nominate Bob Dole for president. That didn't work out too well, but they, they, I went to the, uh, in fact, I, I went to the uh, uh, convention like a week later when it was, first of all, it was very strange to be at the convention a week after the public ends. You, know, you, you go to the men's room and you think, I think Newt Gingrich was in here. I don't want to be in here. But also, I'd ask like all the bellhops and all the service people, okay, wor worst tippers, comic conventions or Republican delegates. <laughs> And they, they said, oh, the Comic-Con guys are great. The, 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 the Republican <laughs> would give us a Bob Dole button as a tip and say, hold on to that, only worth a lot when he's president. Uh, but a couple years later, I met one of the people who was in the city council chamber of com, wherever he was, he was a representative of San Diego in dealing with the convention. And I mentioned that I told him that story about the dole buttons, and he said, that will never happen again. Usually a presidential political convention is the thing that um, 
uh, cities beg for. They they fight like crazy. They'll kill to get the Democrat convention or the Republican yeah. convention. He said, "We realize we'd rather have Comic Con. Comic Con is more was did did better for the city. Was better for the city than." Uh, and I don't mean this is a sign of the Republicans. This, it was the same thing if the Democrats had. Been. Yeah. If if it came down to, we, you know, we have to move Comic Con if we want a presidential political convention, they would say no. Now, um, so that's one of the big changes. How important we are, the size of it, the scope of it, the fact that, uh, you know, Jack Kirby. One of the predictions he made was, and I think I quoted this last year, um, Comic Con will be so big it'll take over the city. Correct. And it'll be the place where Hollywood comes every year to sell the movies they made last year to find out what they're going to make next year. That's basically what, what has happened. Yeah. That's what's basically what's happened, yes. And that's a change. Uh, I think the fact that you now say Comic-Con to anybody and they know what it is is a change. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know, you know, it, I, other than that, it's all, it's all, you know, again, by virtue of being at every one of these things, I've been tracking slow evolution. If I only went every five years, I have a better answer for you uh, because things change slowly. The, the cosplayers have become an amazing part of the convention. Um, they were an annoyance at one point, and now they're one of the featured attractions. Um, you know, you know, every year, they, you know, the network sent TV cameras down to shoot the Comic Con, and of course, most of what they use the cameras on is people in costumes. And I don't know what the percentage is. My guess would be there's no more than five percent of the attendees in costumes. But if you look at the news, you think everybody was in a costume. So oh, my, yeah. my mother, who never got to the convention, would call me and she'd say, "How was the convention, Mark?" And I'd say, "Oh, it was great. We had a good time." She'd say, "What were you dressed as?" Yep, I and get I, that all the time. <laughs> and I would tell, I would tell her Batgirl, of course, every year. <laughs> uh, anyway, but uh, uh, you know the cosplayers are a new innovation. Um, you know, I mean, there, there's something that yeah. Go ahead, sorry. No, you're fine. I was just going to say we were actually going to ask you about this. Uh, one of our readers, Erin, she asked, "When did you first like?" feel like you start to notice cosplayers showing up. Because if you look back at like the original photos, you know, Comic-Con, like you, you don't really see people well, I, in costume. I don't there, like. there, were, there were masquerades at most of the conventions. I don't know when they started exactly. I hosted the masquerade one of the first years they were in the old convention center. I think it was the old convention. Anyway, I, I hosted it one year and I... I couldn't pronounce all those names of characters I had, didn't know, so I baked off after that. But um, it, it was a gradual thing. But, you know, it was basically the masquerade leaking into the Bane convention, people walking around in their costumes for the whole thing as opposed to Saturday night. Um, uh, I, I think, you know, what I, that somebody suggested this to me, and I think it's true. One of the number one reasons we have more cosplayers now is that everybody's got a camera. We all have cell phones. We all have cameras on us, um, and that's one of the reasons. Also, there have been some cases. Uh, you may know probably know more about this than I have, where somebody has gone to the convention in some elaborate costume, and someone has said, "Hey, we're making a movie. Would you be interested in, you know, doing design work for, for us or something like that?" People have gotten careers out of this, yeah. uh, and that, of course, is an impetus to do it, um, and. Uh, and the costumes just get better and better, and uh, and uh, the one thing I wish is that the people wearing them would learn that if somebody's got a camera, that doesn't mean you can pose right in the middle of whatever you're, everybody else is walking and wave your sword around. Um, I have actually, I actually stopped a small child from getting seriously injured by a cosplayer about three years ago, and I got very mad at this person who was kind of clueless, like. Well, it's part of my costume. I've got to wave the sword around. Yes, not in front of a baby. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, next. <laughs> James, do you want to ask Mike Nelson's? Sure. Uh, Aaron had another question. Uh, oh, Mike Nelson's? Where's Mike's at? You, you can do whatever. If, if Mark, okay. If you could relive one panel or event from the last 50 years, what would it be? Um. The John Broom panel, which I talked about here last year, was a 
wonderful experience. There's a few panels I'd like to relive and, and, and correct things I did stupidly. Um, I don't know. You know, um, I think sometimes we didn't realize the treasures we had. We used to have these Golden Age panels. I was the moderator of them for many years. We'd have all these guys up there, and occasionally a woman, who had done comics in the 40s. And I don't think we appreciated how special it was to have those people there. Um, we kind of took for granted that there'd always be golden age artists and writers around. And I think I would like to go back, wish I could go back and ask them more in-depth questions and quiz some of them more fully on one-on-one -on -one about their work and find out more about things. I mean. Um, we had a, we had some wonderful resources there we didn't tap properly, uh, but as far as you know, if 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 the question is what would you enjoy so did you enjoy so much that you'd like to live it over again that John Brew I'll tell you we had a panel um, once um, it was a very unusual panel it was not scheduled we had a panel where we had in the same room four people who had worked on Action Comics number one. We had, wow. we had Sheldon Moldoff, who drew a page in there. We had Fred Gardiner, who drew a story in it. We had Vince Sullivan, who was one of the editors then. And I'm thinking there was another person I'm leaving out. But we, had, we actually had all these people who worked on the single most important comic book ever published, Action number one. We also had Jerry Siegel's Widow, and we had Joe Schuster's sister and we talked about who did what on the first action comics and how the superman story was reformatted from newspaper strips and uh it was actually an unscheduled panel we suddenly somebody pointed out to me we i did the golden age panel that year and somebody pointed out to me you know we have a bunch of people at this convention who worked on action number one why didn't we schedule a panel about them and I thought, oh my God, we, should, we, we need to. And I ran to the convention and said, give me a room. Give me a free room. And they, they found a room that wasn't occupied because somebody else, someone of the panel had canceled. And with that, it wasn't in the program book. We spread it by word of mouth. And we went in there and we did this panel. It was fortunately, it was videotaped. It was a very important piece of history. And I was sitting there wishing I had had more advanced planning to prepare for it. Uh, I didn't even get a chance to reread Action Comics number one before. Uh, but that panel, which I think we had like 80 people there for it, and still to this day, people thank me for putting throwing that together at the last minute. Um, a once in a lifetime thing. We did a panel, I did a panel once with the last, with, with three guys um, Lou Sayer Schwartz, Jerry Robinson, and Sheldon Moldoff who were Bob Kane's ghosts on Batman in the 40s and 50s. Sheldon Moldoff was his first assistant, then Jerry Robinson did it for a long time, then Lucier Schwartz was Bob Kane ghosting for him, and then Sheldon Moldoff ghosted for him for about 15 years. And we got these three guys together, and they talked about working for Bob Kane, and uh, <laughs> some of them weren't that complimentary. Uh, but to get those three, and these men had not met each other before. Uh, they met at the convention and they shared notes about, hey, Bob told me this. Well, Bob said this to me and things like that. And uh, I just I just love that. I just loved all that raw history in front of us. That's awesome. I mean, you've put on some amazing panels over the years. Uh, and as I think we all know, give or take a Gary Marinu, uh, you host pretty much more than anyone at the convention. <laughs> Well, you know, Gary. Gary does wonderful panels too. Gary and I are good friends yes. now. We we had a we had a fight one year when his panel ran long, and we settled it. We buried our hatchet, things like that. But um, uh, the, the thing is about panels. Uh, you know, most people watching this know who Ed Sullivan was. Ed Sullivan did phenomenal shows. He hired people with talent and let them perform. And it's not difficult to do a great panel if you get great panelists. And then I get lots of credit because those people are interesting. Um, yeah. You know, it's it, how difficult. It's like I did a book on, on Jack Kirby, and, and people would come up to me and go, wow, that book is, there was so much wonderful artwork in that book. And I went, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I'll do this to, to do a book of Jack Kirby with a lot of good artwork in it. Uh, you, can, you can get a lot of credit for doing nothing uh, that way. Um, but uh, it's nice. You know, I, I you, you, you probably have somebody asking a question if I ever got bored with Comic-Con. There was a period when I did. In the 80s, I got started getting bored with Comic-Con because I didn't have enough to do there. And I stopped going the first day. I'd go down on Friday instead of Thursday. And, I even, and I'd sometimes come back middle of Sunday. And then they started me doing all these panels. And I did more and more of them. I suddenly found I enjoyed doing the panels because I had some place to be. I had something to do. I didn't, I didn't have to walk around the building all, of it, all for three days. I had places to sit down. And I could run panels that I wanted to, to hear. And I wanted to interview these people. And so I began enjoying that tremendously. And people think I do it for them. I do it for myself. I'm selfish that way. I do panels I want to that I want to experience. No, I think that's great. I mean, and obviously people must enjoy the panels that you would have put on. But uh, Sarah asked, what tips would you give uh, someone who wanted to host a panel for the first time? Uh, first of all, come figure out what it's about and then people the panel with people who will talk about that thing and not too many of them. If you have 19 people on the panel, the people up there are gonna you know, each say, talk for one minute and their yeah. attention span is gonna waver. And um, you know, if, if the panel looks bored, then the audience will be bored. Keep the number down to people so that everybody feels actively involved. I don't usually like to do a panel with more than six people on it. And I've done perfectly wonderful ones with three people on them. And the people should have something in common. One of the mistakes that a lot of conventions make is they say, oh, let's put this guest and this guest and this guest and this guest on a panel so that they're appearing on something. But that those four people don't have anything in common. They yeah. don't have a common, there's no common topic they can all speak to. So this guy talks about his work and then he stops and this person talks about their work and he stops. And um, so that's the key to a good panel is just, have it be about something and then cast it appropriately. Um, and then as a moderator, keep it moving. Um, ask people questions that that inform the people to understand what's going on. Sometimes you have to jump in and someone tells a story and says, oh, that person is so-and-so. They, they've left out identifying who someone was or whatever. And sometimes you have to just jump in when somebody has said the something and is saying it again and again and stopping them. Uh, as you should be doing with me. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and the only, the other, t here's two other tips for panels. One is if you're, if you're nearing the end of the time of the panel and somebody says something wonderful that grates, that gets fabulous applause or something, say, thank you very much. You don't have to fill every second of it. End it on yeah. a high note. End it on a big laugh. End it on a high note. End it on something wonderfully poetic somebody says. Don't just sit there. The worst thing you can do is sit there going, now, does anybody have a question? Does anybody have a question? If nobody's asking a question, either you ask, either you ask a good one or adjourn. Yeah. And, yeah. So uh, these are things I've learned the hard way. I broke every one of these rules many times when I was starting out. That makes sense. All right, James, do you want to ask Aaron's other question? Sure. Uh, are there any new or recent writers or artists that you enjoy uh, in the current comic market? Um, there's a lot of people who are really good. I don't follow current comics that much. Uh, I read a book, the thing that Tom King wrote recently, and I thought well, that was wonderful. I'm not prepared to say he's the best guy out there because I haven't read enough of his competition. But it was very, very good work he did. Um, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not qualified for that. I, the, the comic book market is not programming for me. Uh, it's an, I'm not the typical reader. Um, I, I slipped off the comp list at DC. They used to send me all the books for free and I was reading fewer and fewer of them every time. And finally I slipped off the list accidentally and they went, oh, we're sorry, we, we made a mistake. We'll put you back on the list. And I said, no, don't, I, I don't. I don't like throwing them away. I don't like them piling up on red. I'd rather not get them. So um, I, I read a lot of books that are 
about comic history. I read a lot of collections of old newspaper strips or reprinting old comic books. But I'm not, I'm, the, the problem is that they're not doing my Batman to these days. They're not doing my Spider-Man. They're not doing the, you know, the Thor I grew up on. And it, I'm not putting that down. That may be a perfectly wonderful um, uh, version of it. Maybe a better version than I had as a kid. But it's kind of like, you know, I, I haven't gone to, I'm, I'm going to go back and see a Dodgers game again when Sandy Koufax is pitching again, you know. Um, and I haven't gotten around to a James Bond movie that didn't have Sean Connery or Roger Moore in it. I mean, uh, they're maybe fine. They're just not not something I could, I have the time in my life to investigate now. I'll get around to them, I, I'm sure, at some point. You know, it's not. It's nice that these things don't go away. You know, there's. I have not watched Game of Thrones at all. I can watch it next year. I can watch it the year after. It's always going to be available. I think you're right. Yeah. All right. Uh, Sir Lister of Smeg asked, "Do you think that the new president of Comic Con, whoever that may be, uh, will change the direction of Comic Con in major ways, or just go with the current flow?" Go with the current flow. Easy answer. I think so too. I think so too. All right. Did we have any... we'll, always, we'll always change a little. It would change in subtle ways with John Rogers still in command, but it's not going to be a major difference. They, Like I said, they perfected doing that convention. They're not going to turn it into something else. Yeah, I think so too. All right, James, did you have anything else you wanted to ask or see any other reader questions? I did not see any uh, that we wanted to ask. Um... So we really just wanted to ask if there's anything you can tease coming for Comic-Con this year. Well, this year, if you attend Comic-Con, you may just see me set the world's record for hosting the most panels. Woo. I am, I am uh, probably going to break my previous record of 16 one year. In fact, I'm That's sure I'm going to. I might, I might be up around 20. Um, wow. So I'm going to do all my eating and sleeping now. Uh, to make up for it, but uh, there will be a number of panels about the history of Comic Con, uh, and uh, I think some of them will surprise some people. Some of the stories. Uh, I hope. I hope if you attend the Comic Con, you'll go to at least one panel about the history of the convention. Um, other than that, you know, uh, there are certain panels I do every year. If, if, if you right. may have figured this out by now, if you look at the schedule. You know, I'd always do quick draw followed by the cartoon voices panel. On cartoon Saturday. voices. Yep. I do another cartoon voice panel on Sunday. I do a Jack Kirby panel on Sunday. Uh, these will pro almost all my usual panels will be in roughly the same place. They might move yeah. down a half an hour or move in a slightly different room. Um, but other than that, um, I haven't I haven't really gotten fully into the list of what I'm doing yet. Um, you know, ordinarily. Uh, we set them around now in the next week or two. Uh, I am amazed at the people who will call me the week before the convention and say, can you help me get a panel on the schedule? And I say, what? <laughs> Maybe for next year, but this schedule was, yeah. this schedule was locked months ago. Um, yep. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of planning that goes in, into this convention. And, uh, yeah, um, I, the only thing I know that will be different is we will be doing a lot of panels about the history of the convention. Um, and I'll be on a number of them, either as the moderator or just a panelist, you know, sitting. I was there. I saw it myself. One of the nice things is there's a bunch of us who can, like, backstop each other. Scott Shaw will tell a story that is hard to believe, but five of us were there to see it. We can endorse <laughs> it and say, yes, that really happened. We saw that. We were there. Um, and I can tell a story, and Scott was there to see it. We, we're, we're each other's, you know, corroborating witnesses. Was is uh, was a panel pitched to have the the five or six of you who have gone to every Comic Con be on a panel? Yes, I think I think there will be one. Yes. Oh, uh, that's awesome. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I believe there will be one. The, the schedule wasn't finalized yet. I've got. Notes here of oh this is this is actually I just picked this up off have this is actually my list here of panels that are being discussed um, and it's got cartoon voices one and two cover story quick draw the Sergio and Mark panel the Jack Kirby panel we're doing a panel on Pogo 
uh, you know, things like that. Those the, the ones we do every year. And there's a few yeah. new ones here that aren't, you know, locked in yet. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, there's still there's still time for somebody to think of something brilliant we need to do. Um, you know, you wait sometimes to see who's going to be there. Like I'm going to do a panel on uh, called we do a panel here called That 70s Panel, which is about 70s comics. This is what we came up with after we could no longer fill a panel about 1940s comics, 1950s comics, or the 1960s comics. Now we have the trouble of filling the 1970s panel. And I'm kind of waiting to see who's going to be at the convention that I can put on it because there will be people yeah. who are coming to the convention, not as guests, but under their own power. And we want to tap them into being at the end. Well, even, even the people that they've announced in the first few uh, weeks of uh, guests, they're, they're, it looks like they're pulling from as many years of the history of Comic-Con as they can to bring special guests this year. That's right. You know, you know, uh, um, one of the things that I get asked about a lot is, do I think Comic-Con is too, too oriented towards movies and TV as opposed to comic books? And I tell people, look at the list of people that they invite. The list of people that they invite are comic book artists, comic book writers, or people in allied uh, fields. Y yeah, maybe Tom Cruise is going to be at the convention this year. I don't know that he is or isn't. But he wasn't invited by the convention. They didn't pave his way to be there. At other conventions, um, and you know, the other big conventions, the ones that, that try to juggle their, their turnout numbers to sound like they're bigger than San Diego, they will look at the, when it comes time to figure out the guests, they say, who can we get who are going to get draw people in? Who's going to attract yeah. people in? The comic book convention, Comic Con International, does the opposite of that. They just say, who should be there? Who would we like to have there? And we'll pay their way there, and we'll make them a guest of honor, and we'll honor them. Uh, it's the exact opposite. Other conventions are going to say, you know, to offer six figures, money, huge money to like a William Shatner or whoever is playing, you know, superheroes this week and in movies or folks like that, or or somebody who was on uh, in Game of Thrones or whatever. Comic Con does not make efforts to get those people. Somebody yeah. will show up because the studios will, will do presentations and the studios get them there, but Comic Con. Their guests are people like me. Their guests are people like Sergio and Scott Shaw and Stan Sakai and Wendy <laughs> and, and dogs barking in the background. Uh, they, they, uh, uh, that's who the important people are to the convention. And uh, uh, you know, so I'll be there and Scott will be there and Sergio will be there and lots of great cartoonists will be there. And if you walk around that room, you can meet some wonderfully talented people in Artist Alley or elsewhere, uh, creative people, uh, people who deserve recognition, uh, and who don't matter at the big conventions. They matter more at Comic Con. We, I mean, we fight the same battle all the time. Like anytime people tell us that, we we ran the numbers a couple years ago, and like if you look at the breakout of panels like comics compared to movies or so on and so forth like the comics panels are like astronomically there's more than anything yeah uh, so i mean yeah we, I, mean, I, mean, yeah, I mean yeah okay people are talking like crazy because there's a panel with the whole cast of some tv show there fine um that's exciting and and but, uh, but to me, the, the, the essence of Comic-Con is how many different types of panels there are and how, how yeah. opposite that panel with the big movie stars or TV stars, there's eight panels about someone's new graphic novel or someone's new comic book or the history yeah. of things. I'm, I do most more of the history panels probably than most people. And we're running out of comic book history. I'm running out of people to interview. But we're going to keep doing as long as we can. And... and it's it's important. It's an important part of the convention, and that's what they spend their money for. The convention does not spend any money to get celebrities there. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for joining us. And before we let you go, uh, we're going to ask, how can our readers find you on the internet? Well, you it's, it's hard to avoid me. If you can spell Evanier, you can find me. Uh, but basically, I'm at, uh, my blog is newsfromme.com, N-E-W-S-F-R-O-M-M-E.com. Uh, uh, it is a 
blog full of my opinions about things, comics, cartoons. Don't go there if you like Donald Trump. Uh, and uh, I talk about animation. I talk about my career in show business such as it is. Uh, I talk about Comic-Con. I just have what is ever on my mind. Uh, I'm posting a thing tonight about the, the stray cats I feed in my backyard. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's my blog, and I'll do whatever I want on it. Uh, and that's, that's, right how, that's how I'm reachable. And on, there's, there's links on there to send me email. There's links on there to other things I do. Uh, it's, you know, it's way too much me. I've been doing it since uh, December of 2000. Um, and because what happens is between comic conventions and blogging, I've gotten really, really good at stuff that doesn't pay any money at all. <laughs> Oh, so, I feel you there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you guys are raking it in with this, with your blog, but but I don't. Oh, that, totally. You know, I, I I have like little these little Amazon links, and I have yet to have a month where I didn't where where I didn't lose money at Amazon by buying things. You know, I, I suddenly have like I have like eighteen dollars of credit from my donors this 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 month, and I go. Okay, I think I could use some more moisturizer, you know, or something like that. Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, it's it's uh, there's a connectivity that the internet provides that, that obviously there's a lot of downsides of it. Um, we can all tell about terrible things that have been posted on the internet or be happened because of, yet there's a very positive connection. You guys are doing a, a, a blog that informs people and it helps them. And you're not doing it because it's making you rich. You're doing it because you're passionate about your subject. And I think that's wonderful. I, I just, that's the side of the internet I love where everybody is is giving and everybody is saying, I've got something wonderful I can give you. Here, I'm going to share it with you. Even if I want to, you know, do a Patreon thing and I want a little money out of you, it's still, it's still, it's there out of passion. And then the internet is full of passion. So I, and I, I really, I love your blog. I watch it all the time. I just... Thank you. Hope, hope I get mentioned once a year. It's, it's nice. <laughs> we mentioned you more than once a year. <laughs> no, no, you do. No, that's fine. And and uh, uh, but I mean, I learned. I mean, I tell people to come. This is. It is very important if you're going to Comic Con. Study the convention's official uh, website. Study your blog too, and take the time to figure out what you want to see, where you want yes. to go, where you're going to eat. How you're going to get from you know your hotel to the convention? Do some planning. If you just go and try to figure it out when you're down there, you're going Terrifying. to have time. Yeah, but make yourself out a little map of where you want to go in the dealer's room. Make yourself a list of the events you want to see. Make yourself some appointments with people you want to hook up with and find a place to meet. That's an important thing. Uh, remember that cell phones don't always work in the place. Uh, uh, the, the number one usage of the DC comic, the most important thing about the DC comics booth at the convention is a meeting place. <laughs> anytime, <laughs> anytime anybody says, oh, I'm going to get together with you, Mark, let's meet at the DC booth. That's what it's there for. There the fact that they're selling comics is, you know. I was going to say, I'm not, I'm not sure they're thrilled with that being the main purpose of their booth. <laughs> Hey, they should be happy that people go there and say, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I just love the convention and I love the people who love the convention and I love the people I see at the convention and I love the, 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 the sense of sharing that is there when people put on these wonderful panels. And, and mine are easy, mine are real easy. I mean, the people who put really work into their panels, I, I really appreciate what they do. And, uh, Anyway. So. Well, thank you again so much for joining us. Okay. Uh, you are truly our favorite guest that we have. We've had I'll, the last two years, so thank you. I'll, I'll be back next year. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. All okay. right. Okay, I want to watch. The, you go do. I'm gonna go watch the news. You guys do that. Thank you. Okay. Thank All you right. so much, Mark. Bye. Yes. Thank you. All right, so we are just going to get straight into the news. Uh, James, do you want to talk a little bit about parking? Sure, that's really the only newsy news we have this week, and that is parking emails went out for the groups. So those yep. of you who got selected for a group should know whether you're in groups one through six. 
and Group One it's starts. Actually one through four. Oh, it's only one through four this year. Yeah, Man, messing me up. Okay, I know, right? one four. That's it. Um, so the first group will start on May thirteenth. I think it's at ten a.m. I think I, I so. Looking. It's ten a.m. Anyway, it's May thirteenth. Make sure you're there because uh, convention center parking. I think last year sold out before Group One was done. Correct. I looked that up the other day. So if you want convention center parking, make sure you're in there early when it when it goes live. Uh, otherwise, yes. most things lasted until the second group. And some yes. stuff lasted uh, all the way through. The stuff that's further out obviously lasted, lasted all the way through the groups. Yes. Truthfully, uh, Convention Center always sells out first. Bayfront always sells out second. And then, for the most part, the rest isn't that difficult to get. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and someone asked, does that mean the groups are bigger? I am not sure. So they did it a little bit differently this year. They had people uh, enter in their credit card information, basically just to confirm that they were a real human and not a bot. So that may have significantly cut down on the amount of entries. So I think that's entirely possible. Uh, so the group sizes may be the same and they just add less entries or we may have bigger groups, like you said. So I yeah, don't know I the answer. It's, it, yeah, they, they probably just, the last two groups probably didn't sell very many and they're like, why do we even need them? So yeah. Yeah. Um, Night Bodega asked a question about hotels, which uh, those things are, the wait list is just currently ongoing. And uh, Night Bodega asked, when can I start calling the hotel to confirm my reservation? They won't uh, have about a week before, maybe two yeah. weeks if you're lucky. Uh, very lucky. Usually it's about a week and a half at the very earliest. Uh, and a lot of times it's truly a week before. Um, and don't forget as well that if, when on peak says like, well, we've sent the information to the hotel, it's not like an immediate thing where like they just send it and it's magically uploaded. Like someone still has to manually like do some stuff at the hotel. So it can take a couple days even after on peak sends the information to the hotel. So it's also never like, well, if one hotel has the information up, the other hotels will have it. That's not the case. So yeah. just FYI. <laughs> but All in right. other news for offsites, we did have some pretty good news. We had some big news today. Uh, so Somebody laughed when I said this, but truthfully, I feel as though the number one question we've gotten this year is, is Conan O'Brien coming back? And we got confirmation today that, yes, he is. Uh, he was on the Howard Stern show this morning, and he confirmed that he will be back and that he's bringing his band back. But that is truly all that we know. So the big question here right now is on TBS, his show has shifted to 30 minutes but he has done a couple of one hour specials. Like he went to Australia and he went to Italy and those aired as single episode, one hour specials. So I don't know what that means for Comic-Con this year. Obviously he will be there, but I'm not sure if he will be there all four days. Right now, Wednesday and Thursday are listed on the Team Coco ticket website. Uh, as being shows in LA. Now the tickets have not gone up for reservations yet, so they could always cancel those. But to me, that is not a great sign that he will be in San Diego for four days. Right. Yeah. I think if I were a betting person, I would guess that we would see Friday and Saturday shows an hour each, but I have no more information than what I just said. So. so there you go. We won't know until they say something. Basically. All right. Uh, we had some other news about some returning offsites this week, didn't we? Yes. Uh, the interactive zone at Petco Park will be returning uh, to its former uh, style and setting, which it didn't change much last year, but it was being run by another company, the Grand Design. Um, they were running the whole thing, and this year they're giving control back to Petco and instead, they're just doing individual activations there in other parts of San Diego for Comic-Con, which they have been doing many, many years in the past. Yeah. Um, so there really won't be, uh, for you, the attendee, there really won't be much of a difference. Yeah. Yep. But we know that uh, there's, you know, all of those things coming back to the Petco parking lot. Yeah. And that's all. it's always a cool thing over there. And the nice thing over there, too, is that badges are not required so if there's a day that you don't have a badge like that's a fun little place to go hang out and do some stuff all right also returning is the great i never know how to say this sherlock cc let's go with that uh <laughs> 
And it used to be a Sherlock themed party. And now it is a scavenger hunt. That's what it was last year. And that's what it will be again this year. And it basically looks like it's going to work exact the same as last year. Uh, last year, you did have to sign up for like five bucks. They haven't posted that link yet. So if you want to participate, just keep an eye out for that. And also returning uh, this year will be Wayward Cocktails uh, run by Supernatural Wiki. It will be July 18th, Thursday, at the Garage Kitchen and Bar at 6 p.m. Uh, tickets are on sale now. And I think they're around $72 plus fees, but they have different ticket package options and things like that. So, so just check, check, and check the links on the site and head on over and see what tickets they have. Well, actually, I just clicked on it. Uh, right now, it looks like all the general admission tickets are sold out. But they yeah, kept checking both the price and the quantity yesterday, like every five minutes. So maybe keep checking. There you go. There you go. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of other offsites on our calendar, which is actually slowly starting to fill up, which is always exciting. I added a couple more this week, like a Heroes and Villains art pop-up exhibition on Tuesday right before the convention. And uh, it's a little bit far out, but a musical comedy called Body by Taco Bell, which, as Mark said, it's my blog and I'll do what I want. <laughs> <laughs> so... So let's uh, real quick, to... hold on. Hold on. I'm going to answer a couple questions okay. here real quick. They're about offsites. Uh, let's see here. So Lister of Smeg said for Conan, could it be four shows over two days, 30 minutes each? Sure, it could. Uh, but considering that he's bringing the band back, which he only did in his one hour specials, I would say that that is not the most likely scenario. But anything is possible. Yeah, I'm, I'm expecting it to be the normal Comic Con Conan show. But Less. if they don't cancel those days, then it's just going to be Friday and Saturday night. And either they're just going to do two or they're going to do multiples in a day and then they'll run them for a week. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I think, too. OK. Uh, and then I would ask, does this mean Mr. Robot Ferris Wheel is coming back since Petco has control now? Mr. Fer Robot Ferris Wheel has never been to Comic-Con. First of all, thank you very much. Thanks uh, for reminding us of the pain. Yes, thank you. Uh, Kindle the other day was actually like, you've made a comment about the Mr. Robot Ferris in a while. But I worked one into Petco. <laughs> there you go. Uh, that Ferris wheel was some random company that wanted to charge like two bucks a ride. I don't know if it will be back. It's my answer. Let's see here. I think that's and some people are asking about Funko. Hold on. I am going to talk briefly about Funko. Uh, so Funko Fun Days. We're still waiting on a whole bunch of information about it, including when tickets go on sale for the general public. They have started their uh, forum lottery, which they do every year. And basically, you have to have been on the forum for a year, and you have to have so many points, and you have to jump through all these hoops. Uh, basically... And then you can sign up and say, hey, I'm interested in tickets. And they decide if they give them to you or not. They do that for, I want to say, like 100 people, maybe 200. Not, uh, but basically, they did that the other day. I don't think they've announced winners of that yet. But probably once they do, we should start getting announcements for when to keep an eye out for regular Funko Fun Days tickets. Yep. Yep. All right, on to exclusives. Yes, let's head into exclusives. And we did have a few this week, including the start of Factory Entertainment's uh, exclusives. Uh, and the first one up was the Wonder Woman Metal Miniature, which is continuing the DC line of metal miniatures. They are uh, three inches tall and $40 each. Uh, you can also, if you want, uh, add the 2017 and 2018 exclusives, the Cyborg for $30, or sorry, the Cyborg is 40 and the Batman is 30. So you can add those to your order when you order them and have, pick them up at the show or have them shipped. Yep. And then next we have the uh, Nerd Vaults. And those come in Joker, Harley Quinn, and Shazam styles. Uh, these are little, basically little uh, purses slash coin things slash holders slash whatever you want to keep in them. And they have little clips on them so you can attach them to lanyards or backpacks and such. They are $10 each. And again, you can either pre-order or uh, to pick up at the show or have it shipped to the con. And uh, 
we would also make sure you know that um, actually there's also mystery boxes, which we have no picture yeah. for because it's a mystery. Uh, they're doing uh, actually, sorry, I forgot to attach them and she's doing it as you speak. <laughs> They're limited to 300 boxes, uh, 60 bucks each, and the retail value is approximately $175. Um, those can be ordered to ship or pick up as well. Um, and yeah. as far as picking up goes, you will be able to have a dedicated pickup window if you order to pick up at the show. And that is uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from 2 to 5 p.m. And then on Sunday from 11 to 1. So if you order to pick up at the show, you have those four days to pick up your items and uh, makes it really easy because it helps keep the line short when you have a dedicated window. Yeah. So I want to mention a couple things about uh, Factory. First of all, if you order the premium mystery box, that one you can't pick up at the convention. That's shipping only. And second of all, they've moved booths this year. And apparently, I have not triple checked this, but I saw somebody earlier say that they moved to IDW space. So considering IDW has had a couple of financial issues, I'm very curious if that means they might not be at the convention this year. Yeah. But they, <laughs> didn't they raise some money, though? I don't I know. Raise some money. I don't know, but it is interesting to me that Factory is in their spot. So I don't know what that means, but there you go. <laughs> yes. What I for you. All right. Uh, my good buddy Patrick Balsteros showed off his second Game of Thrones print this week. And it is based on the uh, the Long Night episode, which was basically the big battle episode. And if you haven't looked at it, it looks amazing. It's got pretty much all the characters uh, doing what they were doing in that episode. And it's really cool. Just like the other one, it will be available in a one day sale sometime this month on his website. But the big debut will be at Comic-Con. Exact size is still TBD, but it'll be somewhere in the $25 range. So go check out Patrick's booth in Artist Alley. And then we have the Con Ranger Merit Badges. Those, those are uh, badges that you can only get at the convention normally, but uh, for a few days, uh, starting a couple of days ago, you can actually order them in her store. Uh, the link is on our site. They're going to be available until Monday, and they're five dollars each. So, if you want any of these really cool little uh, badges for attending Hall H or uh, making it, you know, somewhere in particular that you feel that it was a, a worthy of getting a badge, head over there and get a badge. And these things are adorable. Like, I think that's such a fun idea. And I, what, truthfully, what I've loved is since we posted this this week, I've had a ton of people send me their photos of like what they've done with the merit badges on bags and clothes and stuff. So I think that's cool. It's very telling that Hall H is the one that has a Hall H badge and a no Hall H badge. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> I think that's funny. Okay, uh, we had a couple more reader questions. Oh, yeah. Uh, Sir Lucius Big reminds us that you can win one of every exclusive from Factory on our site if you want to go there and enter. Yes, you can. Well, not every single, but for the most part. For the uh, most part, yes. Most. Most. Uh, and that will continue. And uh, Factory is actually my first official, official people back on Price Mule, because they're the only ones that I've asked. <laughs> <laughs> So I need to get back on that. Uh, but that's cool. Let's see here. Uh, Fran asked... This is my first year going to Comic-Con. What time do you recommend arriving at the convention center? So I'm going to tell you the same thing that we tell pretty much everyone. It depends entirely on what you want to do. Uh, if you want to see a panel right after the schedule is released, we do a really long but really informative podcast where we basically tell you what time we think you should line up if you just want to make it into the room. Uh, so it's impossible to give a blanket statement as to what time you should arrive. Sir Lister Smeg asked, if you had to guess, how many tokens will we get in the exclusive lotto? So it was 10 total over three days at WonderCon, right? Correct. Three, four, and three. Yes. Yes. Um, I don't know. You and I, I think, have different opinions on this. I am still, I, I don't know. 
<laughs> the question, the number one question to me is, will autographs and exclusives be broken out separately as far as the tokens, or will you just get like, here's your blanket allotment, use it towards whatever? And I don't know the answer. Yeah. Um, Do you think that they're going to increase the amount you get per day? I would not assume astronomically so, though. No, I, it won't be more than double. It might, it'll probably be less, but it won't be more than double. So I would not expect there to be yeah. more than eight per day. And I would yeah. assume that it might actually be five, six, or seven. Yeah, that sounds about right to me. Um, so, again, I don't know. I, I, it depends, in my opinion, entirely on whether or not they combine autographs and exclusives. But we will have to see what the system does. Uh, let's see here. Night Bodega asks, whatever happened to the demolition man, Taco Bell gift carry? So I... It, I am the truly the worst. So here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to set up this stupid box next week and we're going to do it on the podcast. How's that? All right. All That's right. A good idea. It's actually, it's like the coolest thing I've ever gotten in my life. It's pretty awesome. Uh, it is pretty awesome. All right. Sir Lister Smeg said, oh no, we already did that one. Uh, Aaron, let us know that the Hall H badges are sold out online for the mirror. Yes, they are. But if you want any of the badges, you can uh, obviously go on the convention floor. They will be back in small press. I want to say it's like Q15. Don't quote me on that. Uh, but they will have, they promise that they will have all of the badges, including some new ones. So, yay. And Night Bodega oh. asks, any new SD Concast pins or buttons this year? There will be, there oh, will God. be, yes. There will be buttons and pins. Uh, there will definitely be some t-shirts that we give away through Price Mule and there will be more stuff TBD as soon as I price it out. <laughs> Got too much to do, kids. All right, uh, let's see here. Uh, Night Rodego also asks, when will Gary make an appearance on the SD Concast? Never. So, Gary <laughs> probably not because here's the deal gary lives with uh lisa sdcc game of thrones girl on twitter and i mean if you've ever tried to find a photo of her online good luck <laughs> so she's definitely not getting on our podcast but we love you lisa <laughs> and we love gary <laughs> so plus you I just don't think take she's over yeah he would he's a dick like that all right is that all? I think that's Is all. Anything else? I don't. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, you want to read that? I do. I was waiting to see if any <laughs> last second questions popped in, but you're all out of luck. Uh, if you, uh, badges, yes, there are still some badges available. How? Contests. Uh, we have a contest hub on the site, so just head over to our site and check out what contests may be running to try and get some badges. Uh, and they will obviously probably increase in number as we get closer to the con and yes. uh, check them out. Yes. And speaking of contests, uh, real quick, I wanted to mention, just like somebody mentioned earlier, we've got those factory giveaways that we're doing. But we are also giving away a pair of tickets to the Padres. And if you've not already signed up, you've got about four hours from right now if you're watching live. So please go uh, sign up to win the pair of Padres Comic-Con night tickets that include a cool hat. And we're doing our fan of the week, attendee of the week, right? That's attendee great. of the week. Attendee of the week. So if you would like to be attendee of the week, uh, head on over to our site and send in the questionnaire, and you may be picked next week because we just pick them when we pick them. Yep. And you and I don't even pick them. Nope. <laughs> nope. All right. Uh, Prize Mule is coming back this year. Uh, like I said, Factory is for sure in, and I've got a whole bunch of other people who I'm very certain will return. I just need to reach out. Uh, and I'm sure we will have a whole bunch of awesome goodies for you. That we you are all laying around the con wherever we may happen to be that day, all over the con. A lot of them will be at the Omni. <laughs> <laughs> just what? saying. What? All right. Uh, you get tips on where to find Prize Mule. <laughs> that's right. If you watch the podcast. All right. Uh, PaceyCon will also be back. Well, I say back. We haven't done PaceyCon before, but basically it's our reader party. Uh, but we are calling it PaceyCon this year after the greatest Comic-Con video that's ever come out. And 
I do promise that we are going to do slightly more giveaways this year than we have in the past. We've got some pretty cool ideas, actually. Uh, venue is still TBD, but it will be Sunday night this year. So if you are looking for a chill way to in the convention, come hang out with us. We are mm -hmm. moderately cool people. Sometimes. The only Comic-Con after party that's after Comic-Con. That's right. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, select right. snag asked if, if they can get a signed exclusive napkin. Uh, absolutely. I will even number it if you want me to sign it. <laughs> I'll sign it too. That's fine. <laughs> Whatever. You know. We could even get Gary to sign it. What? We could. <laughs> you like, do you bully sign it in blood? It'd be just like all purple. <laughs> yes. Totally. Then you see, hey, here's a purple napkin. You signed it already. Yep. All right. So uh, you can join us, James. Oh, yes. You can join us at live every Wednesday until Comic-Con for all the news, views, and special guests leading up to SDCC 2019. You can also sign up for a newsletter, and you guys will not believe this because I barely do, but we actually sent one on <laughs> Monday or Tuesday, and we're going to keep sending them if at all possible, every week leading up to the convention. So go sign up. Uh, th th there may be a link on the side of our site. I know there's one in the show notes still. Yes. yes. Uh, so in closing, thank you all for joining us. Thank you so much to Mark for joining us, joining us again this year. We really appreciate him uh, giving his time to talk to us. Um, Carrie, where can we find more of your work on the internet? You can find me online at... Carrie Dixon on Twitter and literally nowhere else. Uh, and real quick, Mike Nelson asked, is Patch of Grass returning? I still have cups, so yep. <laughs> <laughs> James, where can we find more of your work on the internet? I am on the internet as Dan Regal, everywhere, Twitter, Tumblr, Flickr, everywhere, Dan, at Dan Regal. Uh, also, uh, thank you to Beth, our producer, for editing the show, creating the slides, and, and putting them up on the live show, and all the other things she does to get the podcast done. Yeah, we are on iTunes. If you'd like to subscribe, the links are up on the blog, or you can search for SD Concast. If you like what you've heard so far, please review us. We are also on Stitcher Radio, and the link is in the show notes. If you want to get a hold of us, you can send us an email at sdcomiccon.blog at gmail.com. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash sdconblog, or tweet us at sd underscore comic underscore con. Thank you all for listening, and everybody, go... go <laughs> My dogs are so happy. <laughs> this Hashtag is over. Never Gary. <laughs> <laughs>